Good afternoon and thank you for being here. By now you all have read or are certainly aware that the NCAA's Committee on Infractions released its final report regarding a more than five year review of the Ole Miss football athletics program. The report focused on 21 alleged violations of NCAA bylaws involving former coaches, staff, and student athletes in our football program. We are deeply disappointed and angered by the additional penalty of a 2018 postseason ban. It is simply not warranted and is based on fundamental flaws in the NCAA case and how the investigation was conducted. We will vigorously appeal the additional postseason ban. It is clearly an excessive punishment. And we are outraged at the unfair characterization of our football program and the university culture involving athletics. As we have stated before, for those violations that are backed up by facts, the university is in agreement and has accepted responsibility. And as the chair of the committee himself noted on the press call, we understand how serious the case was and we took strong actions against those responsible for the violations. Every staff member, coach or student athlete who was found to have, been, have committed an NCAA violation has already been held accountable. We do have institutional control as those controls are how we discovered many of the violations and those controls also provided strong compliance education to staff, students, and to boosters. Let me be clear, today is a sad day for the entire Ole Miss family. My heart breaks for the young men in our football program who displayed such resolve and focus in competing this season, despite knowing that there would be no postseason opportunity for them. And now the NCAA has unfairly punished these young men who have already been through so much. We will fight for them and appeal. I want to thank Ross Bjork for his leadership throughout this entire process and for fighting for Ole Miss. And I want to thank Coach Matt Luke for setting an example of character for our student athletes. I'm going to now turn things over to Ross Bjork. <clears throat> thank you, Chancellor Bitter. Thanks for being here this afternoon. This is obviously a very tough day for the university and our football program. Based on the decision from the Committee on Infractions earlier today, the young men in our football program who have already suffered so much will continue to feel the, the effects of this case. As was mentioned by the Chief Hearing Officer earlier today, our corrective action showed how serious we took this case. We self-imposed very meaningful penalties and took appropriate action to take responsibility for the actions that resulted in violations. The committee accepted all of our self-imposed penalties and determined that our case was a level one standard case. However, we are in strong disagreement over the addition of the 2018 postseason ban and plan to launch the appeal right away. We believe that today's decision from the committee is an excessive application of the penalty structure. And the citing of previous University of Mississippi infractions cases from more than 30 years ago is not applicable to our current case. Considering that we are one of only three SEC institutions that went more than 20 years without a major infractions matter, this is a gross misapplication of the charge of lack of institutional control. The question is, when does a university get a clean slate in the infractions process? There are many factors that call into question the procedures of this case and the credibility of evidence that was presented at the hearing. We plan to restate those facts in our appeal materials. There are other aspects of the case that we will also appeal and we will determine the specifics of those matters in the next few days. From the very beginning, our approach to the investigation has been consistent. We focused upon two things. First, when we uncovered facts that were violations, we took appropriate and decisive action based upon those facts. Second, when facts did not support allegations we, or, or we felt the process was unfair, we challenged the NCAA. 
We indicated our disagreement in very forceful and strategic aspects as evidenced by our numerous filings, letters, and pushback over the past few years. Something changed in the spring and summer of 2016 and we strongly disagree with the tactics used by the enforcement staff to keep us isolated in the final months of the investigation. This will also be a basis for our appeal. Our responsibility to compliance has been and always will be the cornerstone of Ole Miss athletics as evidenced by our consistent proactive approach to compliance rules education and monitoring. I'm grateful for Chancellor Vitter's unwavering leadership and support through this entire process. He exemplifies a steadfast commitment to integrity that permeates every aspect of our university. We are here for our student athletes in our 18 sports and that mission will not change. Since we are digesting the full report, there are many things that we may not have answers for today. We wish that this were over, but there is more work to be done and that work has already started. Now I believe we'll take questions. Chancellor Vitter, based on everything that's transpired in the last five years, do you feel the NCAA is corrupt? <laughs> Let me, let me answer more specifically. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions. I think something happened, fr quite frankly, about a year and a half ago, just before the draft night from 2016. The course of this investigation changed. The entire conduct went from one of cooperation to uh, one where we were shut up, where information that should have been obvious to pursue, uh, that we would have certainly noticed and and, and followed up on was not. And by the time uh, the facts became known to us, uh, that information was no longer available because of the time sensitive nature. That's an example where we could have been uh, led to an entirely different conclusion on some very key matters. So I, I really am very upset about the way that this process was conducted. It was unfair, it was not appropriate for our for our university, for our student athletes. Ross, uh, what wins will you guys have to vacate? That is still being determined. Again, we're just digesting the full report, and so we're not exactly sure until we go through each of the, the findings, if you will, and determine the seasons. We know some, but until we go through the final report, we're not exactly sure the vacation of wins yet. This is for Ross or the Chancellor. You, you talked about April or the spring of 2016. Was there a moment that the, the tenor and the tone changed with the NCAA? Was there an interaction, a specific instance that you thought this is going in a different direction? Well, roughly at that time was the draft night, although I think the change actually happened shortly before that. And it was just the situation where we were not apprised of situations that the NCAA was concerned about. So we could not conduct our own investigation. We could not provide relevant information. And we were not given access to the sources of information that the NCAA was looking at. That's, that is grossly unfair. This question is for Ross. There was a, uh, in the original notice of allegations, the, the, the committee came out and said that you guys didn't exhibit exemplary cooperation. Today on the conference call, um, Greg Christopher said that both the university and also uh, former head coach Hugh Freeze exemplar, it did exemplarate uh, cooperation. What, what's going on with all of that? Because uh, it's kind of confusing. <laughs> well, I think uh, to their credit, they acknowledge you know, the, uh, the resources that were spent on this case, the time that it has taken uh, to get information on the table. And I think a lot of it, again, was, was really self-discovered by our institution, by our compliance program. And so they did not cite exemplary cooperation. Um, so I don't understand how people feel we did cooperate because we pushed back. We made sure that everything we did was based on fact. And if there were violations, we took action. And if there were disagreements, that we did push back. So exemplary cooperation is only one strategy in the overall uh, tone and tenor of this process, but we do have an obligation as an NCAA member institution 
to cooperate. We would rather be a part of the process than isolated because we know what happens when you're isolated. And I think we felt the effects of that after spring, summer 2016. Was there ever a specific issue with anyone at the NCAA in terms of an enforcement COI where Ole Miss made a request to say, hey, this is inappropriate or we object to this particular matter? I think, again, we're, we're putting a lot of documents onto our website, umncaacase.com. There's a lot of those filings, a lot of letters that were sent either directly to the enforcement staff or once we got our notice of allegations in a committee hearing date were sent directly to the chief hearing officer. So all of that is in there. So it's not really one individual. It's the process. It's the manner, again, in which we were isolated from that process that we pushed back on. And we wanted access to the facts. And we felt that we were shut out of those facts. So it was more procedural. It wasn't necessarily an individual action or person inside the NCAA. Correct. You felt it was more procedural. Correct. Okay. Uh, Ross, this is for you. Um, does it anger you and the rest of the staff that for most of this investigation and the better part of the last few years, it, it was just Leo Lewis's word against yours and that, that was the main source, a lot of the information? You know, again, a lot of this will go into our appeal, uh, but we are, we are shocked <clears throat> that they found him credible. That was listed in the report today. So we are shocked by that based on all the mountain uh, of evidence that was presented. But a lot of those basis will be a part of our appeal. Um, are, we, are we sad? Are we angry for the institution, for our young men? Absolutely. We think that they have suffered long enough. The institution has suffered long enough. When you cite cases from 30 years ago, that is not part of the process. We think that is, is unprecedented in some ways to be part of this. And so, yeah, there's anger, there's frustration, there's sadness. But now we have to go to work and make sure we get back on track. This is for you, Ross. What will the appellate process entail? And um, are there additional avenues for action if it isn't successful, such as potentially rolling into p pending lawsuits currently to file for a stay, for example, against the bull ban and kind of fight it in court? We have, we have 15 days to state that we are appealing. And so we'll file that as soon as possible, hopefully early next week, that we are appealing. We'll submit a lot of our materials are already written, back to the question earlier. A lot of our materials, we believe, are already written. And so then after that, we'll submit those materials. It's probably a, a three to six month process. We don't exactly know because it depends on the turnaround time of, of some aspects of it. But sometime in 2000, early 2018, we hope to have a, a final outcome. And, and we're appealing the postseason ban. We're appealing the lack of institutional control. And then the other things are to be determined. Some clarification, uh, Ross, on the transfer rules. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. There's a one more year bowl ban. Will players that are not rising seniors next year be eligible to transfer if they uh, ask yep. for a waiver? Yeah. I know there's been a lot. Of, second uh, second yeah. part of that question, can schools, other schools start poaching or recruiting the Ole Miss players now? Well, that's already happened. We, we know that's already happened. The poaching has already, has already happened. Mm -hmm. And so here, here's how it works. Anyone with one year of eligibility remaining rising seniors, right, they have to notify us of their desire to transfer. And then the receiving institution may file for them to be immediately eligible, right? And so that, that's that process for kids with one year remaining. Anyone with multi-years remaining has to go through the normal transfer process. They would have to arrive at their institution that institution would have to file a waiver through the NCAA, and then it'd be evaluated from there. We don't make that decision. That's the NCAA that makes that, de that decision on multi-years remaining of eligibility. Ross, a thousand times during this process, you mm -hmm. no commented everybody in this room, but it seemed like a thousand times information leaked out from the other side. And I, I want to ask you about my original question. Does that add credence to my theory that they're corrupt? <laughs> you know, it's hard to really address the, the leaks. Uh, the chief hearing officer addressed that on the teleconference today. So obviously the committee was frustrated by that as well. We, we can't control leaks. We know that we were not part of any strategy to leak or deceive or anything like that. We wanted the truth. We wanted the facts. 
If leaks are out there on either side, we can't control it. We have to go based on what we know, and we tried to take action head on and take the responsibility necessary. So I, the leak part, it's hard to say. Who would ever investigate that? I think that's an answer, a question for the NCAA that they'll have to answer at some point in time. Ross, the immunity was given to several players. Obviously, Leo Lewis was the forefront of that. And I, I thought the immunity was if they found something that needed to be investigated, Ole Miss would have their opportunity to talk to Leo Lewis. Did we, you think we had a fair shake at, at un uncovering that information? All, all of that's going to be part of our appeal. It's been already filed in some of our earlier filings and, and letters that we sent. But again, that'll come up again in the appeal. That'll be one of our appeal aspects. Ross or Chancellor, whichever one of you wants to answer. Do you guys have any regrets about the way you approached this case? No, we, we did what we needed to do. Uh, we're appealing this case because we were not given proper due course, and we, we are concerned about that. We're fighting for our students. They've had enough. They shouldn't deserve any more. We're also, frankly, bringing up concerns that might be of general use to our member institutions in the NCAA because it's important to raise issues of concern that affect the entire membership. Limited immunity is not unprecedented. It's been used before and they actually touted its effectiveness today. What is borderline unprecedented is the fact that some of these individuals were at a competing institution in your conference, in your division. At any point in time, was there correspondence with yourselves, Greg Sankey and the SEC, about this situation and the sensitivity of it? Yeah, we, we consulted with the conference on a regular basis. Uh, Commissioner Sankey, with his experience on the Committee on Infractions, was a helpful uh, resource for us throughout the process. The limited immunity he was not a part of, uh, but he could help us guide through, you know, the next steps in our case, the next, you know, prepare for the hearing, and now he'll help us uh, prepare for the appeal as well. Ross, just for clarification purposes, will this be the same governing body, COI, that oversees your uh, appeal, it's or would it be another one? Different panel. Okay. Right, yeah, there's you. an appeals panel committee that would hear the appeal. Ross, did today's ruling have any impact on Rebel Rag's ability to sell licensed goods or anything moving forward? That's one of the things we're assessing right now. And so, again, we have to go through the entire report. Obviously, we disassociated a, a lot of our boosters that are in the case. Um, they were not one of them at this point. So we have to assess that and determine how he can, you know, really be a part of the program moving forward. And, and we haven't had time to do that yet. Sort of the, the narrative from today is that Ole Miss has a culture problem with its boosters. Does Ole Miss have a culture problem with its boosters? If there's one booster that acts inappropriately, to me that's a problem. And we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to not have that. But as Ross pointed out, we're one of three institutions out of 14 in the SEC that went 20 years without a major infractions case. And we are having to deal with cases from over 20 and over 30 years ago as influencing, ultimately, this imposition of a 2018 bowl ban. So we take everything seriously. That's why we're going to be doing things I don't know any other institution doing, namely putting very publicly on the web who the boosters are that violated our, um, our procedures and what they did and their penalties. Uh, they're, they're not going to be welcome at athletics events, and we take this very seriously. Chancellor, what, what is your opinion of how uh, Ross has led this uh, response? I have the highest regard for Ross. He's a great athletics director. Mm -hmm. Everybody who has been responsible for NCAA violations has either been severed from the university or has been held accountable. And Ross is going to provide the continued leadership so that we can forge ahead and, and, reach, and reach new heights in our athletics program. Ross, in terms of uh, conversations you've had with, with Matt, with the team, what's the general sense of, of their response to this news and what are the words you shared with them in regards to moving forward? We had a, uh, we had a team meeting this morning at uh, 10 o'clock. Obviously, I'm sure through social media they had heard 
about it, but Matt uh, wanted to address them, you know, face to face. So the chancellor, myself, and Coach Luke uh, met with the team who could make it this morning. And obviously, you know, again, they've been through a lot. You know, I think a lot of them are resilient now. And the message was, look, we just went through the same thing last year. We have to do the same thing next year. Um, but we are going to appeal. We are going to fight for them because they're the ones that should not be punished in this situation. And so I think the mood was uh, a little bit sad, a little bit unknown. Uh, Coach Luke has done a great job of either meeting with groups of the team or with individuals. And I know they're going to have position meetings as well. And so I, I think that right now we just need to stay around the team. We need to be in communication with them and make sure that we can answer any questions that they have. We're also a follow-up question on the transfers. You said you were aware of other schools poaching on the Ole Miss players. Was that legal for them to do it to this point? Is it legal now for them to recruit the players? And which players can they recruit? Is it just the rising seniors, or can yeah, they, they can, recruit all of them? They can contact the rising seniors, and then the rising senior ha has to notify us. So there needs to be communication. Um, and so anyone that's contacting underclassmen with more than one year of eligibility would be breaking NCAA rules. Has that been turned in by y'all with you being aware? We're, we're tracking a lot of things right now. Ross, staying on that line of the transfers, based on the fact that you're appealing this bowl ban, does that delay their ability to transfer or are they still open? We're not sure yet. The, the process for them will continue. They can move forward with whatever process they want to put forward through the transfer you know, mechanisms. How, it, how an appeal would affect that, we don't know that answer yet. Ross, have any of the rising seniors indicated this morning that they wanted to transfer? Have you heard any of that not, yet? Not to my knowledge, no. Based on the anger, uh, the unfairness that you've expressed today, would you still do everything the same way again if you had to do over? You know, obviously there'll be a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking, you know, related to this case. We, throughout the entire process, Chuck, again, believe that we're better off being a part of the process, not on the outside. And so the pushback was very, very forceful, was very, very strategic. It was never behind a podium. And so people can criticize that, they can argue with that, but there is a process that you go through to push back. If people knew the, the number of conference calls, the, the angst that we shared throughout this, especially after the spring, summer of 2016, I think people would understand that we push back. Again, if you look at some of our filings, that will become public. If you look at our supplemental response after the hearing, I think people would understand the position that we took to defend the university. Ross, uh, one question about the scholarships here, and it listed here on, on page 54. Tell the difference between a grant, and there's 13 grants, 10 initial grants, and will Ole Miss ever go underneath 81 scholarships in any given year? So we, we have served already 10. So we, we, we reduced our scholarships by a total of 13 over a four-year period. Okay, and it was a 15% reduction off of 85, right? And so this year, we were down six scholarships, right? Last year, we were down two scholarships. The year before, we were down one scholarship. Next year, we're down four scholarships. So we'll be at 81. So that gets you to 13. The 10 initials are part of the signing class. So you're capped out at 25. You can only sign 25 student athletes in your signing class. Some you can count backwards and some you can move forward. So we're restricted by a total of 10 initial signees and that's spread out over a three year period. So none of that changed. They accepted all of our self-imposed penalties with really the exception of one and that's the 2018 Go back to draft night again for a second. You said the tone and the tenor of this changed in April. 
do you think that draft night specifically affected the way that they approached this investigation? And also you're talking about how there was a sudden change in the way that the cooperation between the institution and the NCAA, how that cooperation deteriorated. What, in your opinion, I'm not asking you to speculate, but you've already stated that there was a change. Why did that occur? Was it draft night? I, I don't want to speculate on why it occurred, um, but what was up to that point a process where we could investigate and contribute stopped. And we were, we were kept out of the process and it became a one-way process. And for, for that reason, uh, I just don't think it was very fair. And there are things that to me are pretty obvious that should have been done, should have been questioned, should have been looked at that weren't. And in some cases to the point where now it's even impossible to do that. So uh, the tenor changed. And it's also important to point out that nothing from draft night, any of those allegations were found ultimately even to be credible and were not part of the case. Just as a follow-up, post-April 2016, that involves the three Lewis interviews with the NCAA and the sort of path they took to connect him with Rebel Rags, as well as the other allegations against the boosters. Is that what you're referencing specifically that you feel that you were left out of? Oh, yes, we were left out of that, that process. Yes. Just for clarity, either one of you, if it weren't for this extra bowl ban, would you have come out of today, I don't want to say satisfied, but okay with the results? Well, um, the NCAA accepted everything that we self-imposed and with one exception added this new penalty, which is the 2018 postseason bowl ban. So we would have been disappointed about findings of institutional control or uh, other aspects of, of their findings, but we could have, we could have lived with the, the consequences. The bull ban is just not acceptable. 